Jason Whittle from One Creative Environments. Uh, we're a multidisciplinary design practice. Uh, we're firmly in the SME bracket. Uh, we're about 35 staff uh, strong. And we uh, contain all of the main design disciplines in-house. So we're quite a small team. Uh, and it really helps our, our collaboration being that small with so many disciplines within, within uh, one organisation. So we've heard a lot over the last couple of days about what BIM can do. Uh, we've talked about the theory and what should and shouldn't be done, but what I want to try and show you today is actually what that looks like. So I'm going to be using some um, real project examples to try and cover some of these uh, aspects here. So what I want to do is um, look at uh, one of our live projects um, to look at um, how uh, basically data has been uh, pres prescribed and then delivered. So we're going to look at the, the BIM execution plan and BIM scope of works and seeing what they're asking of uh, the supply chain. I want to look at uh, level of detail and the, and the project data sets that have been prescribed. Restructuring data via IFCs. We've talked about IFCs being uh, the, the common uh, exchange format, but I want to show you how you can also use IFCs to manipulate data. And then also reusing that data, and I've got an example here uh, for using it for uh, quantity takeoff. And then I want to take you through uh, model auditing and 3D signing, a sign off process and then concluding with how uh, we're monitoring changes on models that are developing uh, continually. So the project that I want to use uh, today is, uh, is Rathbone Square in Oxford Street, London. I'm not going to spend too much time talking you about exactly what the project is and who's involved because I could probably spend my whole time doing that. But it's in, in summary, it's a £180 million project uh, being led by uh, the main contractor, which is uh, Lend Lease. It's for Great Portland uh, Estates. And our role on this, we, we are engaged by the supply chain. Uh, that gap that we've talked about, that skills gap where the supply chain are, haven't got yet uh, capability to, to, to deliver BIM, we're plugging that gap. And it was quite interesting, uh, Tim's slide yesterday, uh, when, uh, Tim for SMEs, where he showed that uh, empty, uh, no, that, that wallet and said, uh, help yourself, basically. Well, we do ask uh, the supply chain to open their wallet and we don't see that wad of 50s inside trust me it's more like moths and some belly button fluff that comes out it's not a wad of 50s so this, the supply chain are under great pressure to deliver a lot of information uh, for not a lot of money so it forces us all to be efficient and lean in, in how we deliver so uh, the project here uh, this is uh, I say Rathbone Square it's roughly divided into two halves We've got the residential accommodation block. There's 142 apartments, really top quality, high-end uh, stuff, penthouse suites and that sort of thing. And then we've got the uh, commercial side, uh, which is this half, and this is going to be Facebook, uh, Facebook's new UK headquarters. So if I just, uh, I've taken some, uh, some videos of the, the models. Unfortunately, I couldn't um, use live models because the, the tech here doesn't quite allow it. But what I want to show you here is basically one of the federated models uh, there are over 600 models on this project. And that's not that there are 600 members of the supply chain, it's just how the models are split up. So each of the supply chain members is probably delivering anywhere between 10 and 50 individual models because it's split up by floors, by zones, and by packages. So you end up with about 600. So the package that I want to talk to you, uh, or using my examples here today, is uh, it's called the amenities package. And this is where a, uh, a specialist subcontractor uh, needed to uh, provide BIM deliverables but doesn't have any BIM capabilities. They typically farm out all of their 2D drawings on projects uh, anyway, so they approached us to deliver or to tender with them. Uh, they didn't understand the BIM deliverables. They said, do you understand what, the, what these are asking for? I said, uh, yeah, we understand what they're asking for. We can provide that for you. So our role on these sorts of projects is one of supporting the supply chain, trying to bridge that gap. Some of the supply chain members do have 2D drawing offices already set up. And in that instance, we can provide uh, 3D deliverables, uh, do data attribution, Kobe drops, all of their, all their uh, 3D deliverables, and we can hand the model over for them to take the 2D drawings from. Um, equally, if they've got some uh, resource in-house that they're looking to upskill, we can also work with them in that. And we're working with um, six subcontractors on this particular project. And we've got other projects uh, that are similar as well where we're helping the, the supply chain. And there's not one size fits all for any of these because they're all at different levels uh, of their own development within BIM. So as I say, this is our uh, model and this is just using uh, Navisworks, uh, Navisworks here 
uh, to show that. So the, the BIM competence assessment. We had to go through a BIM competence assessment. Um, this is a statement here uh, from the uh, uh, BIM execution plan and uh, the, the tender deliverable saying that you need to fill in the BIM competence assessment. Now, PAS 91 includes a perfectly good BIM competence assessment. It even says on here, this is going to be used for government procured projects, departments that have, been, that have commenced implementation of the BIM strategy. So why on earth people feel the need to keep changing them and adapting them, uh, is, uh, I'm not sure. But we are seeing now BIM competence assessments that are like war and peace. I think you'd have to be Mervyn himself to, to fill in some of these. Um, and also, there are some pretty scary ones out there. This is not, the, the example on my next slide isn't from this project. It's not one that I've personally encountered, but it is genuine. Um, this here is BIM competence assessment. If you state yes to all of these things, like do you use CAD? Do you have access to the internet? Can you use a spreadsheet like Excel or Open Office? And you tick yes to all those, your BIM maturity is level three. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> this is out there. Presumably it was access to the internet that, that swayed it for them, I'm not sure. But um, the competence assessment here, I appreciate that's not a great slide to present, but I just wanted to show you the typical length of one. It was loosely based on, past, uh, on uh, BS uh, 90, the 91 document because there are similar questions in there. And basically it asks for statements about your own policies, examples on projects and that sort of thing. And so we provided that to, to get through that with, the, um, with the, the contractor. So it's worth stating, the client is the major influencer of the culture and standards on their project. And this is absolutely true. If the client doesn't ask, the client doesn't get. Or if the client asks too late, he might get, but he's going to get charged for it. He's going to get a charge a lot more than stating it right at the outset. It comes back to this, and we, I don't need to spend too much time on here, because all I need to do is echo the, the importance of what has already been stated. The importance of setting those employees' information requirements out right to the start. This is going to enable uh, the project to have uh, consistent uh, delivery uh, standards. Okay, this is extracts from the, the, the BIM scope of works. Uh, and in here for this particular package, which I'm using as an example, we've got our model element table. So this has been taken from the master implementation delivery plan, and this splits out what this individual subcontractor needs to provide for this project. So basically, we are providing all these elements that are listed within there, and then it summarizes the deliverables in there. And so it starts talking about uh, that uh, needs to be in a court, named in accordance with the BIM execution plan, uh, needs to have uh, the data that, that um, is, is set out and uh, modeled to the right level of detail. <coughs> and there's also some neat workflows in there. So this is just a, a little, a little extract, extract. Then, this is the good stuff. Okay, so in here, they've not specified Kobe. They've, uh, or they've decided to take a look at their own or organizational information requirements. What do we need as an organization? And they've distilled it down to quite a neat, small number of um, data sets. So in here, you can see in here, there's about uh, 14 data sets, and those have to be applied to all objects within the model. So each of the supply chain members, all subcontractors, have got an obligation to provide a digital asset complete with data. And if it's an M&E asset, it also includes these as well, like uh, SFG 20 codes, asset numbers, uh, and that sort of thing. The, it then also starts to... Uh, just to confirm, as the supply chain are added through the course of the project, which one of those are, are applicable, just to make sure that there's no, uh, no misunderstanding there. Right. So now I want to show you how we're adding that, that data into the project, because it's, it's quite easy to say, add data to models. And BIM is about, uh, it's about the data. Uh, we've already established that. And a model uh, is purely a vehicle to attach data to. The model isn't the be-all and end-all. The geometry is not the be-all and end-all. It's just a place to put the data. So what I want to show you here is how we took, uh, an approach that we took to, to, to put in that data in, because I think it's, it's often seen as perhaps one of the dark arts of BIM, is how you put the data in. I mean, a first, a first impression, you might say, well, every single object has got to have all that data. I'm going to be there for weeks and months putting that in. But it doesn't have to be the case. OK, so what we do is we use uh, shared parameters within uh, Revit. So I'm just uh, zooming in here to one of the elements here. I'll show you up here. We're going now into uh, shared parameters. I've already uh, set up a shared parameters uh, template. Sorry. 
this is um, because I'm starting and stopping this. I've already set up a shared parameters template. So that is basically a text file that sits behind the Revit document. And, and as you can see in there, there are our data sets. So all I do then is I basically apply those into the project. So what I'm doing here is I'm setting them as a shared parameter. That's important. I want the data to be grouped with it under the data. And then I need to choose which of those is an instance and an instance and a type parameter. And that's really important because what you want to do is put it in the, the least amount of data entry is, that, that you can. So most of the, uh, the data that's required on these are type parameters. So if I apply that type parameter to, to a wall type, once I use that wall once or 50 or 1,000 times, all that data is going to be applied to that wall. Then all I need to worry about is really the, the spatial parameters. And then what I do is I uh, assign those uh, shared parameters basically to all objects within this model. This is um, a multidisciplinary model with multiple elements. It's not just walls or ceilings. So we're applying it uh, to all the elements. So let's see if I can continue this. Yes. OK. So then what we can do is I've uh, brought those shared parameters in. If I click on one of the walls and I go into my type parameters, down here, neatly under that data tab, you can see where most of the parameters now sit. And you can see within there I've uh, started to pop, I've already populated those once. Then all I need to worry about here are the uh, spatial parameters, the ones that are left. So there are only three parameters that I need to apply to individual objects as I go through. The next thing um, I do, or I'm able to do, is because they're shared parameters within Revit, I'm able to schedule those. And this is a really um, important thing because what it enables me to do is to see all of that data in a spreadsheet and I can quickly flick through it and I can see whether there are any holes. And what I can do is if there are, if I spot that there's an error in there, I can spot, uh, I can change a type parameter. So I'll click to that and then it'll tell me, beware because you're going to change all of the types that relate to that. So I can make uh, quick and easy changes to my data without having to click on individual objects to see whether I've actually captured everything. It's like a, a self-auditing process. And that's just all you know, straight out of the box w uh, within Revit, uh, as long as you can use the, the shared parameters. Okay, great. Got my data into a model. I've done my job, haven't I? Well, I think it's worth just showing you what can happen to that data because it's really important that we, we, that we share and we reuse data and we try and anticipate how other people are going to use that data. So what I'm going to show you here <coughs> is a straight, <coughs> excuse me, a straight export from our Revit model into Navisworks. And I want to show you what um, happens to the data. So we've got our model neatly structured by, uh, by uh, levels. I'll go and I'll zoom back into that wall that I clicked on in the in the Revit example, and now I'm looking for my uh, for my data. So I'm going to look in my uh, properties tabs, which is where you'd expect to find it. But where's it gone? I know it's in the model because I put it in there, but it's not there. So now if I click under this one, I can start to spot a couple of those parameters. There's one uh, dumped into there. There's one hidden in, in the min in the middle there. I can filter the, the information by its properties, so I know that the information is in there, but this is very helpful for when we're doing BIM coordination meetings. The main contractor, they um, considered, and we, we agreed, that it was really important that when you're in a BIM coordination meeting, you've got all the models in together, you need to be able to click on an object and see who's generated it, what it is, uh, what level of detail it's been modelled to, uh, everything that, all the good stuff that we're putting in there, that data needs to be available. But that isn't available as a, as a, as a uh, just as a matter of course, just because you put it in one model, it, it isn't available in the next one. So what we've uh, we've done through uh, quite a lot of pain, actually, and um, a bit of research, is to use the IFC format to restructure the data. Uh, we generated a, uh, a workflow document that has enabled us to uh, schedule those parameters in Revit, use the IFC exporter plugin, because we're using Revit 2015. I know that... Uh, capability has moved on now with, with Revit 2016. But we use the, the Revit uh, plugin, and that enables us to remap the data. So this is um, just one extract of, uh, of our workflow. And what we did is we uh, basically documented every single tick box that we had to put through, exactly how we exported it, exactly how we imported it, and then we circulated that to the, uh, the main BIM coordinator uh, on the project, and then he shared that with the rest of the team. So now we're able to get consistency of data through that. Um, I've, I haven't, well, I have got the whole document here, but it's not the sort of th thing that I think is really I think quite, quite dry to present. But effectively, it's a, it's a workflow that, that, that 
that does that. So now let's look at what's happened to the data. Okay, so this is now uh, been through the IFC export measure, and as you can see, it's already been restructured. But all my um, all my geometries here, all my levels are still there, so it's still got a lot of the good stuff intact. But now I can click on any object as I'm doing in here, and then neatly in the properties tab, I've got a, a subcontractor tab, and all that information is neatly there. That's, I've made that sound really easy. Honestly, that was a, that was quite a pain to do that, and. I think this is just finish up here. Uh, yeah, clicking on the on the same on the same wall that, that we started with, I can now see all that information grouped together in a nice little bag. Okay. We when we first started modelling projects and working with uh, quantity surveyors, uh, before we before we engaged on a particular project that uh, is going through now, we sent one of our models to the uh, to the QS and said. <coughs> Uh, we think we're pretty good at modelling, uh, just make sure you can use this. And they came back and said, oh, you haven't modelled it right. And that's because our early models didn't have enough data in it and they weren't structured in a way that people could reuse it. What I want to show you now is, now that we've got a data-rich model, just how easy it is to get information out of here. So within uh, Navisworks, all I've done is, because I know that all my data has got uh, attributes, I've created a selection set of a flooring, uh, which is, just happens to be the FL250. As you can see there, now I've clicked on the data set. Uh, I can neatly see that. And what I can then do is uh, go into my quantification uh, tool, uh, which is uh, set up uh, down here at the bottom. And this, again, is just straight out of the box. So I go into my, uh, my quantifications here at the bottom. I select my interior finishes. I drag that selection set into there. And now all that uh, geometry has gone straight into the schedule, and it's also taken the data with it. So now if I just export that uh, to Excel, <coughs> uh, you can see how that's taken all that data. So I've got information there relating to uh, locations, wh what it is, uh, and I've, I've got anything I want in there. I've got perimeters, lengths, areas, volumes, any anything that I could wish for, because it's all in the original model. When you don't have the data in the model, it's so difficult to pick out the elements that, that you need to schedule or a QS needs to schedule. Okay, just a quick note on uh, level of detail, LOD 400. This is uh, the extract from our, uh, the BIM execution plan and it follows uh, PASS 1192, even though frustratingly it did start to use different uh, terms. Just beware that another project that we just tended on referenced the AIA, the American Institute of Architects LOD specification. This is LOD 400 for masonry walls. And the first question we ask is, are you sure you want me to model every block? Are you sure you want me to model every mortar joint? Because I can, but it'll take one of my guys six months probably, and it'll cost you a fortune. And straight away, no, absolutely, we don't need that. So you need to challenge the requirements that are given to you in terms of level of detail. Otherwise, one, you can either get caught or you're, you're going to spend far too long doing that. So I'm not going to go into uh, the class detection because I'm uh, pressed uh, for time today, but I just wanted to show you how that model looks um, at LOD 400. This is a fairly well uh, coordinated model now for one of the apartment levels. It shows uh, how the walls are modelled with um, head tracks, that sort of thing, builders work holes, services, that sort of thing, and uh, the models are in uh, pretty good shape. This is then how the models are audited, and the 2D process cannot start until the 3D is completed. That's part of the workflow. So the models have to be uh, class detected, coordinated, and data attributed before they're allowed to go through uh, to, to take 2D drawings from it. So here you can see uh, the sort of things that they're checking, not visually, they're checking these automatically. So numbered to BIM protocols, exported in, the, in uh, the right format, coordinate systems correct, file size appropriate, agreed units, model scope confirms to the BIM strategy, Model assembly conforms to the strategy, uh, grids and datums consistent, uh, clean, LOD and granularity is um, as, as agreed, and basically all the elements are in there. And as you can see with, within here, we, we're getting the green tick, so we are uh, doing the right thing according to what the, the contractor wants. They're verifying the data. Um, given, just conscious that I'm, I'm short on time, I'm just going to flick through this because there's one more slide that, that I want to show you. Uh, which I think is a good example. So, but what I was going to say here is basically I was going to compare this to what PASS 1192 says is a um, Level 2 project. And, and it is fair to say that Level 2 definition is still, evo still evolving. So I think it's a little bit difficult to say, yes, this is definitely is or it definitely isn't. I think it's pretty close. What I want, just to finish up on now, 
when we issue drawings, uh, you get a revision label. You see one drawing issued, you can see what's happened when it goes from revision A to revision B. What happens with models? Because it's the dark art, isn't it? You can sneak changes in maybe, or perhaps you just forget to tell people. But on a project of this size, where you've got uh, perhaps 30 members of the supply chain, it's impossible for everybody to be talking to each other all the time to commun communicate their changes. So what, ha what, what happens is we've got a, uh, an example here of two structural models. One is at revision 76, one is at revision 79. So it gives you an idea how many times it's changed. Okay, so this is just using uh, Navisworks. And this is a really quick uh, workflow that we use when we receive new models. So basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to select both of those two models that are selected over the top of each other. And they use the, ge the compare geometry function. Now that all that leaves me is the geometry that's changed between one model and the other. So what I can do is I can just quickly um, append my, um, my subcontractor's model. Now I can have a visual look about how my model compares to only the changes between those two models. If I'm not completely satisfied, I can quickly um, pull up the, um, the class detective. And this is um, a fairly quick example, rough and ready. So it's just a class detected to 10 mil. So I'll take the two models, run a class tech. There you go, zero clashes. So just from what, 30 seconds worth of check-in, I can see that the models that have been issued, the changes don't actually touch or affect my package contractors. If they do, then I can investigate a little bit further and report it to the package contractor and say, these are the changes, are there uh, commercial issues? Um, conscious that I've used my time all allotted, I'd just like to say thank you for listening. I hope it's been good.